Welcome to another episode of Greater Good Radio Hawaii, where we develop tomorrow's leaders by bringing you up close and personal with today's top business people. Greater Good Radio Hawaii is dedicated to the promotion and implementation of social entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Evan Leong, and with me is my lovely co-host, Carrie Leong. Thank you, Evan. Today's guest is Nicholas Mitsakos, the chairman of the board of directors for Danya International. He is a founding partner of MKS Ventures, a venture capital fund. Nicholas co-founded nine companies that achieved liquidity events through successful IPOs or acquisitions. Please welcome to our show, Nicholas Misakos. Oh, thank you for having me. So Nicholas, you're so busy, you're involved with six boards. Mm -hmm. What is your average day like? Well, because I have a relatively unstructured day, it means it starts early and ends later than most people's. So uh, even now I'm involved with business in Europe. So early in the morning, I have calls with people in London. You know, during the day, it's very typical that I'll be either on the phone on my way to a meeting or in a meeting. What time does that start? Uh, usually around 6 or 6.30 in the morning. And then it will end at uh, 11, 12 o'clock at night while I'm on the phone with people in Asia. And in between, what happens is I tend to be in a lot of meetings. And most of those meetings are with people who are either operating at the companies or the executives or other board members themselves and unfortunately there's no easier way to do it than to be in person because things get discussed when you're in a room with someone that just won't get discussed on a phone won't be written down in an email and it sort of brings life to the situation and unless you're willing to do that you can't be as effective as you otherwise would so travel time is a issue then travel time is a big issue for me uh, and I'm just permanently jet lagged, perhaps is one way to think about it. And, and it's, it's a, a, a concept that you have to embrace, that you either have staff and employees that do this or, or you do it yourself. And I think it then depends on your makeup as an individual, whether you want to be the person doing it or have people reporting to you about what they've done. And how many employees do you have to help keep you sane? <laughs> the, uh, well, the, the short answer is it's me. And the longer answer is, you know, the employees at my companies who work very hard. Mm -hmm. And so I really do leverage off of them. And I have employees at companies that range from a total of maybe 50 to 60 to one company that has uh, almost a thousand employees. So wait, who, who handles your schedule then? I pretty much handle my own schedule. There's uh, no way to manage all the subtleties from all the inputs uh, unless I get some help uh, from someone who just knows all the things I'm up to, and that's a little hard to, to manage. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, but I don't want to overstate it. I mean, it's it's a choice that I make, and I think that other people have assistants that kind of run their lives. You know, there's that joke from that movie where someone said, "Well, I, I knew your assistant better than I knew you," and uh, sometimes that could be that's true. true though. A lot of times, that that's a lot of times true. And so mm -hmm. I actually try to avoid that. I want them to know me, and so you pay a little bit of a price for that. But I think that's kind of the nature of, of why I do what I do, is to be more attached to the companies I'm involved with. Mm -hmm. Well, that's also a good lesson to be good, be nice to the assistant, because the assistant controls a lot of things. I can't underestimate that. Uh, the, the assistant is, controls that person's life maybe more than you may think. Mm -hmm. And that's an important tip for anyone. How long have you had this energy to be involved with so many things? Well, it, it does help if you're an insomniac. And, and I think that I, I unfortunately get that trait from my mother. So it, it does, I do require less sleep. And uh, you know, maybe when I'm 60, I'll require a whole lot more sleep because <laughs> I'm, I'm deprived. But, but it, it, you know, the energy is, is just there. And I think the thing that's exciting is every situation is new. And so for instance, we, we mentioned some of the companies I'm involved with. So Hawaii Biotech is a very exciting opportunity. And even today, there's something new every day. And before I came here, I had nonstop meetings beginning at around 7 in the morning, uh, up until I just sort of ran over here <laughs> to make this interview. So that keeps you very energized. So with Hawaii Biotech being here, and then where's Nanya located? Uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, in okay. Silicon Valley. And then you have other companies in Europe. What, what are you doing on the plane while you're traveling? I, uh, I read on the plane. So I don't get to watch those terrible movies, and, and maybe that's a good thing. And I don't get to eat much of the airline food, and I think that's a good thing too. But uh, you, know, you don't you, eat because you're working. You, you don't eat at all. Well, I, well, I try to minimize it because the food's bad, not because uh, <laughs> I, I'm so engrossed. But uh, I think that that one thing that you have to that take advantage of the situation as it's handed to you. So the one advantage of a plane is no one's going to call you, at least not yet, right? And yeah, it gives me the chance to read a lot. So it's mostly preparing for 
what I'm going to do when I go there. Oh, okay. So you're not necessarily reading novels or, or no. business books. You're reading actual documents and and uh, just catching up on all these different companies. Yeah. Now, you know, I think it's interesting. I want to make the point about material to read because I think that if, if you're trying to do business, uh, you have to understand what's happening in the world uh, okay. on, on many dimensions. And so, uh, so I think that people can be too narrow in, in what they read. So, for instance, uh, there's a wonderful magazine called The Economist, which covers sort of international news. And I think that should be a Bible for anybody. You read that cover to cover? Read it, uh, uh, try to read it cover to cover every week because it talks about all the dimensions of, of, of business, finance, as well as politics around the world. And I think if you're naive to that, you're doing a great disservice to any company you're involved with because every company today is a corporate citizen. So I have a, several of my companies in Silicon Valley have operations in China and India and in Eastern Europe. And these are companies with less than 100 employees. So if you're going to start a company today, you have to think about a global strategy from the first day. And I think maybe to make that point, that's probably the greatest significant change that I've seen in the almost 20 years that I've been doing this, that we didn't even think about the world outside of our door for the first five years of life. And only if you had a customer somewhere else did you ever think about that situation. Today, the very first day, is, well, what development are you going to do in India? Why aren't you going to outsource that to China? What's happening in Bulgaria, of all places, if you can mm -hmm. believe it? But there's a big software development group in Bulgaria that huh. people take advantage of. Then you have to be aware that this is an opportunity. You have to think it through and have reasons why you do or do not pursue that strategy. So how many company, I'm sorry, how many countries are you dealing with? Well, boy, it, it's hard to limit that. I think that uh, it, it's easily over 30 countries. And some of the companies I'm involved with, it's very typical your first sales are international. I've got one company that does more business in Japan than it does in the United States. What type of products are they selling? Well, the, these are technology-based products. Mm -hmm. And so what, what's interesting, what you're seeing is different geographic areas adapt to product changes. And what's happening is you're seeing more technology being adopted overseas sooner. And so now you're seeing China building out a television network based on internet protocol. Nothing like that exists here. It's a multi-billion dollar project in China. And so if you're a leading edge company like Nana, the company I'm on the board to, if you're a leading edge company in internet protocol technology, you actually have significant customers in China and you don't have customers yet in the United States. And so you have to be aware of these developments. So how are you finding these companies nowadays? Do they find you or you find them? How, how, did, how do you guys come together? Yeah, I think th there's an important characteristic to any company you work with because a company is, is merely the sum total of the people who work there. And so the people really matter. Mm -hmm. And the people you work with at a very high level are the ones that can make the difference. And so the people that I work with are, are at this point, very typically people that I've known for a long time, uh, people that I've, I've met over the years, I've either done business with them or just been aware of So these them. are serial entrepreneurs. This is their, you know, nth time that they've been doing this type of thing. It, 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 typically, although you can have, it, like, for instance, the CEO of, of Google, you know, he was at Sun Microsystems. He was just an executive in the software department of Sun Microsystems, if you want to call that just a job. But now he's one of the most influential entrepreneurs uh, in the world, right, and will be for, for years to come. So... You can be at a company for a long period of time, have great knowledge and insight, and then suddenly see an opportunity that, that you want to take on. Kind of like a tipping point almost. I think there's something to that. Um, one of the things that, that, uh, that we've grown up with is we have a perspective that our parents didn't have. We have the perspective that we can take on multiple careers. We can do several things in the course of a lifetime versus just one thing. And so I actually think that it's overstated that you're either an entrepreneur or not. Uh, I've seen too many blurred distinctions. Uh, again, I've got one guy who's running one of my companies that was an executive for 15 years in a very large company. Uh, he's as much of an entrepreneur as, as I am, and I'd say I don't know if I've ever gotten a steady paycheck. So I thought maybe that's <laughs> what makes you an entrepreneur. Uh, but the other thing, and I, I want to talk about this a little bit, there's a, there's a spirit that, uh, that I think we grew up with that makes it a little bit unique. And well, we can talk about that uh, in a little bit if you'd like. Okay, after the break. 
This is Derek Branch, retired NFL player, owner, and director of Hawaii Team Sports. And you're listening to Kerry and Evan on Greater Good Radio.